Hello, everybody. This is Jennifer Davis, Executive Director of South Texas. We're going to get started in just a few minutes. We're going to give everybody a, a couple minutes to get on. Uh, we've got about 95, I think, registered for this. So we're just going to wait just a minute and then we'll go ahead and get started. All right, welcome everybody to uh, the South Texas Youth Soccer Supporting a Safe Return to Play webinar tonight. Everybody is hopefully muted. Uh, if for some reason you are not, please make sure you're muted, but I think we've done it on our end. Um, we are recording this and we will be sending it out and some other information out as well. So don't feel like you have to um, take a lot of notes. Um, we do have the Q&A feature uh, open, so if you want to ask questions, you'll just hit that Q&A and you can type in questions. Um, we'll be monitoring that throughout and then we are going to have a Q&A period at the end. So some of those questions I probably will hold in there and then just we'll read those out at the end. Some, if they're quick, I can answer them during the, the webinar. Um, I'm going to kind of go a little bit into the intro, we're still getting some more come in, but let me tell you who's gonna be on the call tonight. Um, so obviously I'm on, um, Janae Bukloski, who was our technical director, Gareth Glick, who was our assistant technical director, and Noah Taylor is our director of member services. So we're all gonna cover um, different parts uh, and hopefully help you guys with some of this information. Um, one, Janae, you can switch the slide. Um, just to kind of go over some of the objectives that we have with this call. Uh, we want to give everybody updates on the expected to return to play for Texas. Again, we're basing this on state and uh, some local guidelines. Um, we want to share recommendations from the CDC and the guidance that they have for sport specific and soccer specific re uh, return to play. We're gonna go through what we have for our return to play recommendations. And then Gareth's gonna talk a little bit about um, some technical recommendations for return to play uh, with players and teams and what that may look like. Now, I do want to preface and say um, a little bit of a disclaimer. These are recommendations. They are not mandates. They're not dictate, we're not dictating to you do it a certain way. Obviously, we're a big area, we're a big state. So local guidelines are going to take precedence. But what we wanted to do was provide some best practices, some recommendations that will help you as administrators and coaches to return to play. Um, ultimately, the bottom line is state and local guidelines are gonna take precedence over everything. And as we talk a little bit about our phases, we're gonna talk about the fact that if local guidelines are dictating you can't move forward with the phase, you might have to move back if there's a spike or if there is um, an increase in activity, 
Um, so we have to, you'll have to base that on your own area. So we cannot give standard guidelines across the whole state. So it's gonna be a little bit of localized that you're gonna to have to pay attention to. Um, ultimately, what we say is be smart and be safe. If you have questions, we ultimately say err on the side of caution and being safe with the players and families. A um, little bit of a disclaimer in terms of this is that all the information we're provided is really just meant to supplement, not replace any state or local laws, rules, or regulations. Again, they're not mandates. They are recommendations that we've taken from a variety of sources, from U.S. soccer, U.S. youth soccer, CDC, and the governor's office. Um, so what we're going to go through today is a number of things that you can do to help lower the risk of exposure and reduce the spread as we return to play. So uh, Janae is going to go next and she's going to talk a little bit about organizational considerations and some, some recommendations from the CDC. Great, thank you. Hi everybody, thank you for joining us tonight on the webinar. Uh, I'm want to give you some updates on what's been happening here in the state of Texas. I know all of you are aware of the ongoing and continual updates that the governor's office has been providing uh, in returning into phases of reopening the state of Texas. As you are aware, uh, South Texas Youth Soccer has suspended youth sports until May 31st uh, to align with Governor Abbott's executive orders. Uh, there is some openness in the executive orders, and so we hope that through the presentation, our recommendations will help your planning to provide a safe return to play. On May 31st, youth sports may begin holding practices without spectators other than one parent or guardian per participant. This is from the executive order, which is available on Governor Abbott's website at the state of Texas. Youth sports competitions have been cleared to resume beginning June 15th with social distancing measures recommended. Last Friday, uh, the Centers for Disease Control held a presentation with youth sports national govern governing bodies, and I'm going to provide an overview of the key points uh, for you here briefly. Uh, this statement here is the most critical, and I know some of you are on the phone, so I'll read it out loud, but the more people a child or a coach interact with, the physical closeness of those interactions and the length of those interactions, the more sharing of equipment, uh, the higher the risk is of transmission spread. And as youth sport leaders, this is something that we need to be aware of and to take steps and actions to reduce those uh, risks of transmission. They offered four key areas to consider for youth sports organizations. And it's important to note that on their guidance, and on the presentation that I'm referencing, it's not specific to youth soccer. They had uh, members from all over the country with all different kinds of sports camps, different kinds of organizations. But these four commonalities are something that are appropriate for what we're doing here in South Texas. I'll go through them individually. The first one is to promote behaviors that reduce spread. The second, to promote healthy environments for participants, facilitators, and spectators. The third, to provide alternative models for participation. And the fourth is to prepare for if and when somebody gets sick. We'll start with the first one, which is promoting behaviors that reduce spread. I'm going to just review the bullet points from the presentation from the Centers of Disease Control. And on each of these points, I've included the link at the end that you'll be able to access if you want to read through the documents or see the presentations yourself. For promoting behaviors that reduce the spread, we want to educate staff and families, first and foremost, about when they should stay home and to stay home if they're not feeling well or not comfortable uh, with coming out. This includes continuing conversations about proper techniques for hand washing, uh, covering mouth and using your elbow when coughing or sneezing, using cloth face masks or covering uh, among coaches, staff and officials. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the use of face masks as we get into the technical uh, part of this presentation here in a few minutes. Supporting healthy hygiene of providing soap, hand sanitizers, and tissues to participants at the fields, and also posting information and or using signage at your facilities and on your social media and communication about how all participants involved can maintain healthy behaviors. The second category that the CDC recommends is to promote healthy environments for your participants, your facilitators, and your spectators. This goes uh, along with the limiting sharing of equipment. Uh, that includes not sharing drinks, Gatorades, towels, 
Also cleaning objects regularly and disinfecting common surfaces and equipment. And on that note, the CDC has a list of items that are considered disinfectants. They made a, a very clear distinction between uh, cleaning, sanitizing, and disinfecting. And what we're talking about here is using disinfectants uh, in well ventilated areas to clean objects. Um, sanitizing is great. It doesn't necessarily clean all of the the viruses then the bugs that could be on there. So we do want to talk about disinfecting common surfaces and equipment using well ventilated areas, which is great for us as soccer because we're playing outdoors, most of us, hopefully. Uh, also marking, uh, clearly marking entrances and exits, modifying the layouts of our used space to promote social distancing and physical distancing, uh, closing all communal use spaces such as locker rooms, and providing uh, supplies individually where, po where possible or limiting our equipment use or supplies to one group at a time and then disinfecting before the next group would use them. Again, posting information about how to promote healthy environments uh, on uh, or signage. The third point, which I think uh, is, is something we're probably all doing is to continue thinking about those people, whether they're players, coaches, uh, parents, or referees, administrators, who cannot attend uh, for whatever reason, and to continue to offer virtual training or options for those who do not feel comfortable returning to activity or who at some point in the phase of playing to uh, returning to play need to go back to remain distant from uh, your team or your youth sport environment. Uh, another suggestion is to create small groups, i.e. cohorts, and to keep these small groups together with the same staff member or coach as much as possible. This will minimize uh, the potential spread on contact of somebody who could be infected or be um, spreading it to other people. And so we want to try to avoid those situations and also avoid events where physical distancing could not be easily maintained. Additional suggestions for youth sports are to designate a staff person who is responsible for your club, your association, your organization's COVID-19 response plan and to monitor who will monitor these, these protocols at all events and also to make sure you're conducting COVID-19 response training for all of your staff, coaches, and volunteers. And also, where applicable, to conduct, conduct daily health checks in accordance with privacy laws and regulations. Uh, an example of this might be to ask parents to take the player's temperature before they come to the field. Uh, there are, of course, privacy laws that would come into play if you're collecting medical data. Uh, and using that, which we'd want to hopefully steer clear from, but do come up with a protocol where you're able to reinforce these healthy behaviors in accordance with privacy laws and regulations. Lastly, and I think this is really critical, and from uh, the plans that I have been shared with, this might be an area where I think we all have an opportunity to improve our planning, and that is to prepare for if and when someone should get sick. Again, reinforcing that participation at this moment should be optional and that anyone that gets sick should absolutely not attend. But for us as leaders to establish a plan to uh, transport uh, our transportation procedures for anybody who does get ill and to establish a plan for notifying local health, local health officials, staff and families. But it's very important that we maintain confidentiality. Uh, for example, if somebody should report that they have a fever and that they have been tested positive and they're one of the players on the team, do you have a plan for making sure that the other parents and players and those who might have come in contact with that individual are aware without revealing the, the person's uh, private information and remaining confidential? This is an important note. If three or more of those cohorts or those small groups in an organization have tested positive for COVID-19, both the CDC and Governor Abbott's recommendations recommend that you would work with state and local public health authorities about continued operations. If three or more cohorts do, there is a chance that you might have to uh, pause your return to play until a proper social distancing is followed. Also advising those who have come into close contact with someone who is ill to also stay home and to monitor symptoms, help them understand according to CD recommend recommendations about what that monitoring looks like. And lastly, and this might, need, might not be as applicable to youth soccer, but I do think that there are places where this um, this is something that needs to be thought through, but to close off any area that is used by a, a sick person and to not use those areas again before they're disinfected. This is obviously something that might be um, more critical for indoor sports or sports where more shared equipment is being used, but still something that we need to consider in youth soccer. I'm gonna introduce and turn it over to Noah, who is our Director of Member Services. 
and let him go over the, the preview of the South Texas Youth Soccer recommendation. Hello, everyone. Um, I just want to, uh, from a state perspective, just kind of provide a little bit of um, outline of what we've went through and prepared um, during the course of this uh, crazy time. I know probably what the first slide here is going to be is actually a uh, condensed version of what we work to put together. Hopefully you're familiar with uh, at least a look at this document. Um, but what we wanted to do from a state level was to kind of provide a, um, a quick outline um, to help uh, monitor and um, highlight suggestions of different uh, practices to kind of be on the lookout for when we do return to play. Um, so again, some of these we will touch on, and I know Janae um, and Jennifer had already kind of hit a few of these. Um, some of these are going to be a little bit different from what we would normally consider as uh, normal, um, but the, the uh, whole idea was to kind of make it digestible. Um, it's a little one-cheater, um, and that is also found on our website. Um, so if you just go right on to sdxsoccer.org, right on that uh, main landing page, we have the uh, recommendations uh, for returning to play. Um, it'll list this document in full as a full page, um, as well as um, what uh, the state from the governor's office from the uh, about phase two with youth sports uh, going into effect, as well as uh, the statements from US Youth Soccer. Um, so some of these, uh, for example, would be about, um, and it might seem a little ridiculous considering, um, but avoiding contact with the high fives and uh, hugs and handshakes, but um, even as recently as today, the Major League Baseball um, kind of went through and tried to do another uh, mandate about uh, when they returned to play uh, about uh, the limiting contact with high fives, etc. cetera. Um, so that's kind of an opportunity, uh, especially with youth sports to kind of have the, uh, the kids be a little bit creative with the celebrations. Um, I'm sure if you've seen anything on uh, any of the games that have been uh, cast over in Europe currently kind of see it's kind of a slow transition into these practices, but um, that's just one thing to be conscious of. Um, and then as well as kind of uh, any of the CDC safety uh, protocols and some of these are also going to be facility dependent on what they would allow. But of course, um, and again, these aren't restrictions. They're simply kind of suggestions and um, common practices. Um, so for probably in this, this time with the virtual um, portion, what we kind of have documented here about official group training sessions, what that means is the general liability and accidental medical coverage would still apply. Um, so that would be any player insurance or kind of um, injuries uh, at a facility uh, would be, um, would be uh, covered uh, in a virtual environment. Um, but that would be an official group session. So now that would need to be under the direction of a coach um, via Zoom or a similar platform. Um, but really if a coach or say any club admin is just sim simply emailing out uh, drills or um, you know anything to do on their own time, um, that would not be a officially a quote unquote group training session all at one point. Uh, that would actually fall outside of virtual practice and kind of be at their own risk. Um, so that's kind of what we say with that. Um, but as always, uh, K&K Insurance um, had recommended that uh, any communication uh, with a single player and a coach always be with the parent present. And that kind of uh, touches base on the uh, safe sport um, guidelines, which we have also posted online. So again, here's some, some more of these hygiene practices to kind of be aware of um, moving into the future. Um, these probably have all been uh, ran through everyone's brain at this time. But um, again, what you can do is find at the, uh, our website and again with our social media um, accounts, uh, we try and share any of the um, extremely important announcements uh, to our membership and um, outside just being public information uh, for um, what any suspensions or any state uh, governed uh, restrictions, um, but as well as trying to enlist any resources, this would also include um, any of the club financial um, opportunities uh, during these times. And um, 
yeah, you'll pretty much see everything and probably going into the fall, we've already been working through of how to be a little bit creative uh, using some of these uh, practices into uh, any media and kind of engaging activities uh, into potential giveaways, et cetera. Um, next would just be uh, Gareth Glick from our uh, technical department. He's the assistant technical director for the state. And he's going to go a little bit more in depth of kind of applying some of these uh, recommendations in, into actual training and practice uh, works. Thank you, Noah. Uh, good evening to everyone. Just before we move forward with this, I just wanted to remind everyone, uh, if you have questions, please fill those in in the Q&A by hovering over the, the bottom of your screen. There's an area for you to enter questions there and we can see them on our end. Uh, and that'll give us an opportunity to uh, kind of compile those questions and then answer them uh, during the Q&A session at the very end. Um, there's also a poll uh, with four questions in that I'm gonna go ahead and launch. And so if you guys will just take a, a few minutes to launch that poll um, and to answer it, uh, that would be great. It's helping us kind of collect some, some data and some information from you guys while you're on here. So it should appear on your screen. Um, now it's been launched or you can click on it, I believe, through the bottom of your screen. If you hover over it at the bottom in the middle, you should be able to answer from there. So uh, moving forward, uh, and, and I think uh, Noah said it best when he said, these are really considerations, things for you to think about as you begin your training and your return to play and, and everyone's at different points and at different phases and some people have been doing individual training some people um, are just now starting individual training some people haven't done anything at all uh, so this just for us is, is things that we think you should be considering and thinking about as you move forward um, definitely not mandates um, just a, a thing for you to, to list and, and look through and say hey am i covering some of those things as we go so you know if we break it into four different categories first of all our, our physical distancing i know Janae touched on this, but keeping a team together and maintaining that team as a cohort. And we'll talk a little bit more in a second about why that's important for you to keep those groups together as a cohort, but not mixing players and coaches among cohorts. So players stay within that cohort, um, whatever size of that group is, is mandated by the governor. And we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, and, and trying as best as we can to keep coaches with that cohort as well. And again, we'll explain in a second why that's more important. Um, clearly avoiding any unnecessary contact um, and, and trying to discourage any kind of group excursions or travel. I, I don't think that there's a whole lot of reasons for anyone to be traveling in large groups to play games at this point. Um, so as much as we can limit that, the, the best. Uh, one thing to consider is that as your players are arriving to training, so used to using carpools and sharing rides and things like that, uh, it's probably a good idea to try and discourage people from doing that and to, to make sure that they're riding to and from training with people from their own household. Um, if that's not possible and we understand that parents work and things may happen, um, encouraging people to, first of all, try and limit that amount of car uh, pooling and car sharing unless absolutely necessary, but then using face masks during that ride sharing as a way to try and limit the spread of anything while they're tra uh, transporting players to and from training. Uh, safety protocols, and, and this really, um, starts with the parents that training important that you encourage parents to remain in their cars. Uh, obviously it's Texas, it's 90 degrees already. It's going to be hundred in a couple of weeks and, and sitting in a car maybe for 45 minutes to an hour and a half uh, with the air conditioning going may not be a viable option for parents. And if, if that's the case, um, important to remind them of six feet of social distancing uh, if they're on the sideline uh, and, and that they're maintaining that distance and those protocols throughout the training sessions. Um, also making sure that, you know, any siblings or other children that are out there doing the same, that's controlled. Um, also for players, obviously that social distancing applies and needs to apply during times when you're resting and, and uh, you're having water breaks and things like that. As players return, they're obviously going to be in a varying states of, of physical conditions. So some players may have been extremely active, maybe even more active than they were prior to this. So uh, training two or three hours a day with the ball at their feet and they may be in excellent physical condition. Other kids may have been sitting on the couch playing video games, watching TV, and, and not doing anything. Uh, so you're gonna have players that return in different levels of fitness. It's important to, to make sure you're breaking your training sessions up into these intervals and allowing players to readapt and reacclimate to the weather. Um, and then also making sure that you avoid having players handle any training equipment. The, the key is, is that uh, coaches should be setting this up prior to the training sessions and then picking it up 
uh, after training sessions and, and, and throughout the training sessions to prevent players from touching uh, the equipment. Any kind of hygiene practices, uh, again, encouraging coaches, referees, and staff to wear face coverings where possible. Um, clearly not safe for players to be wearing face coverings, most likely in, in the Texas heat. Although if there's a player who that's what they want to do and they feel safe and the parents are okay with that, um, I would not discourage them from doing that. Uh, coaches, where possible, if they can wear face coverings would be great. Um, definitely when they're in and around large groups of people, um, important for them to, to wear face coverings to protect themselves and to protect the spread. Um, providing hand sanitizer stations is going to be important for all of the clubs uh, and, and places where people can access hand sanitizers, uh, probably not in bathrooms, so consider that. And then also sharing drinks, training equipment, and, and hygiene products is something that we shouldn't be doing. So um, players definitely should not be sharing drinks. They shouldn't be sharing training equipment, trying to figure out systems in which they're not having to use shared pennies. Maybe you're assigning pennies to players um, for the whole training session for a period of time uh, for them to, to wash and maintain. Uh, maybe they're wearing different color shirts to allow you to create numbers um, later on in phases. Um, and definitely not sharing the hygiene products. I think that uh, seems like a, an easy thing for players to share hygiene products, but probably not the best thing for them to do. Uh, continue to promote hand washing, as Noah uh, mentioned, and I believe Janae did as well. Uh, and then thinking about when we bring the group in, be it for instructions, on the sideline during breaks, what's the plan for that? And, and we'll talk about that here in just a little bit, but making sure that we maintain those social distances. Noah already touched on high fives and close celebrations, so I won't go into that. I think they've seen a wide variety of bizarre celebrations in the Bundesliga if they've been watching those games. And so hopefully the pros are modeling proper behaviors in, in those times. Um, also important for you to remember, no one should attend training or games, obviously, if they're not feeling well. That's, I, I think, a no-brainer, but needs to be, to be communicated clearly. But also that if they don't feel safe. I think this is a, a good opportunity for clubs to say, look, if, if you don't feel comfortable bringing your child to training or you don't feel comfortable coming to training, um, then, then that's okay, and there's no consequences for that. And it needs to be very clear that, that it won't be held against players, it won't be held against families, uh, that people need to make those decisions based on what's best for them in that particular time. Um, any at-risk individuals obviously should stay at home, and that's you know someone with a compromised immune system, if they feel like their age is contributing to them being an at-risk population, um, those people should stay at home. Uh, disinfecting all equipment after each use, and again, Janae touched on this, but there's, there's a difference between disinfecting, sanitizing, and cleaning, and, and I would encourage each of you to kind of look up those things and, and to share that with your, your members and your players uh, so they understand what is disinfecting that equipment each time, and especially with your coaches on disinfecting pennies, how they, they're cleaning those properly. And then I think lastly, most importantly, is this communication piece and having a plan. This is going to be a time where it's going to require people to be extremely detailed in their planning. It's going to take lots of prep work in advance. Um, and clearly being able to communicate what that plan is, um, maps of entry points onto fields and, and visuals and, and constant reminders. And, and the communication is going to have to be consistent and constant. It's not going to be able to start at the beginning and then just let it go. People are going to need to be constantly reminded of these things and plans are going to need to be able to be adaptable. Um, and, and, and I think also parents need to understand that if, if these things don't happen, what the potential consequences are. And we'll talk about that here in a second. So I, Janae and, and I talked about this uh, uh, quite a bit, and, and this has been a point of discussion in a lot of webinars uh, over the last few months, but it's important for coaches to think a little bit more about the player and the whole being than it is to just think about the, the tactics or the, the training session or, or what the team is doing. So, you know, consider that players are dealing with a lot of things over the last few months. They're they're dealing with schools being canceled and that sense of normalcy uh, going away, that belonging to their friends and their, their, their school environment, their teammates, all these things that give them their identity have gone away in the last month or two. And, and while people have done a good job of trying to maintain some sense of normalcy for these players, there is a lot of unknowns. Uh, and as coaches, it's important that you dig a little deeper, that you have an understanding of what's going on in players' lives outside of the training session, um, knowing if someone at home is, is uh, struggling with, with the virus, if the family's been affected by the virus, if there's been um, people in the house who have uh, a compromised immune system, maybe someone's going through chemotherapy, maybe someone is, is living with their grandparents, understanding all these different elements that may have uh, raised awareness and, and heightened the tensions for the players that are in their, their team 
and, and being able to kind of be a, a place where those players can, can vent those social and emotional uh, challenges um, and, and being able to, to kind of guide them through that process. So it's important for coaches to keep these things in mind as, as the players return and not just focus on the game, but focus about what they can bring back to these players. Uh, and most coaches do that. I think almost all coaches are in this game for that reason. And so it shouldn't be a problem, but, but something to constantly remind your coaches within your, uh, under your leadership. So when you're actually planning for, for your training sessions, um, these are all elements that, that we kind of brainstormed and watched and saw other people and, and have talked and, and listened and came up with these points of things to consider. Um, and, and I hope that most of you have considered these things, but, but definitely wanted to kind of have a checklist here of things. And I'm sure there's things that we may have not considered here as well. Um, but, but the age of the players and the maturity level. So, you know, an 11 year old might have been doing nothing for the last four weeks, five weeks, six weeks, and they may be able to go out and run around for an hour and have no ill effects. But a, a 17 year old may not be able to do that. Um, and, and so there may be different areas where you need to periodize the, the work rest ratio, uh, recovery times for activities, and you're gonna have to keep a, a constant eye on what's going on within your, within your teams and within your groups to be properly prepared for that. Um, also considering uh, acclimating to the summer weather. You know, they left in, in early March and it was 60, 70 degrees and they're returning to summer heat where you look at the temperatures for next week and we're talking mid nineties in, in parts of the state. Uh, that's a big difference. And so players are gonna have to reacclimate to that summer weather uh, and keep that in mind for the timing of your training sessions, the length of your training sessions, those kind of things. Um, also considering their developmental level. And, and obviously varying de de developmental levels all the time in, in players, but also what a player may have done in the last couple of months. They may have regressed, and that may be a point of frustration for some players. So, um, you know, having them get comfortable again and, and being on the field again with a ball at their feet and encouraging them to, um, to continue with what they're doing, uh, and not become frustrated and give up. Or maybe a player has progressed and they need to be challenged and, and you need to find ways in which to do that. Uh, also considering field space and making sure that you're planning properly to have proper spacing within the field and that the players have areas to move where they're not going to be interacting with other players. Uh, and also creating a buffer time zone between sessions. And that may be 15 minutes, 30 minutes, but a, a time period where players arrive um, and, and they leave that is separate. So one group is leaving their training session. Another group is not showing up at exactly the same time, that there's a gap. Um, you might use parents or volunteers for this to, to motion people in from the parking lots. We've heard from different clubs and organizations that have said that they're going to use parents or coaches within the organization to hold players in the cars and in the parking lots until the, the fields have cleared and then to motion those players onto the field. Just something to consider as, as you, you get into this. Um, obviously, organizing that available space and maximizing the space, but, but also keeping those distances is important. Um, making sure you're considering the distancing while explaining activities and drills um, and keeping distance between players and coaches. Uh, one important thing, and I think a lot of people have considered this, but um, is specifying locations for players to put their bags, to put their water. Uh, this might be cones where you say, this is cone one, cone two, cone three, and you're assigned to cone one, you're assigned to cone two, uh, and to where that player puts their bag and their water, and when they leave from the training field to go get water during the breaks, they go to their cone and only to their cone so that they're not interacting with other players uh, inside of the six feet uh, social distancing. Again, an op opportunity for you to use parents and, and volunteers or other staff members within your club uh, in order to do this. So it might be staggering your training sessions to allow people to, to gu guide these players and parents where they need to go during these times. So I, Janae touched on this and, and, and it's really important, I think, that this is a communication piece for, for coaches, for players, but also for parents. That, that social distancing and the things that you're asking people to do is not only to protect people and to protect the people who are weaker in our communities and to prevent spread, but also to prevent spread so that we don't have to revert back to where we are. We've, we've obviously gone through a two month time period that's been extremely testing and trying for people um, and, and economically, socially, mentally, physically, all those things that have uh, been affected. It's important that people understand that just because we're progressing into returning to play and into a phase and another phase and, and hopefully moving forward to playing games again, it doesn't mean that we cannot end up having to revert back. And so it's important that people understand that these phases are not just we've got to the next step, that's it. We've got to the next step, that's it. And there's no going back. And so 
you know, encouraging them to follow these protocols so that there doesn't have to be a step back, but also being clear that there is the potential for going back. And that may happen for things that are out of our control or even things that are under our control. So um, being clear with that with parents and with players. So here's our, again, maybe not our recommendation, but our, our kind of our thoughts and guidance on how you might implement a progressive return to play and an example of how that might look. Uh, so phase one for us uh, is, is kind of two part. And I think this depends on what the players have been doing and you have a, a good understanding of this within your club and each group and team is different. Um, if players have been at home with a ball at their feet for the last two and a half months playing, you know, off a wall and, and dribbling and juggling and doing all those things, there's the potential that the last thing those players want to do is return to training and start with, hey, standing in a square with a ball at their feet on their own for 45 minutes or an hour. So if, if that's what's been happening, maybe there's a way to return to training uh, next week on a Monday with small group training that allows them passing patterns or no contact drills and things like that. And we'll show you some examples of what that might look like, um, but avoiding lines um, and, and when you do have lines, maybe staggering them in a zigzag where they're not doing something or having another station for them instead of standing in line where they're juggling or they've got a ball at their feet, um, not using their hands, not touching the ball with their, uh, anything but their feet. So definitely keeping in mind in phase one that it depends on where your players are coming from. From there, they might progress into phase two. Phase two is not um, uh, an option until Monday, uh, according to the governor's guidance, um, after May 31st. So phase two would be the introduction of some sort of defensive pressure and contact. So now you might build it into 3v1s, 5v2s, maybe instituting rondos or using 2v2 and 3v3 small-sided games going to goals, uh, perhaps targets or end zones, these kind of things, but building up into maybe what looks more like the game with a 5v5, uh, some mini goals and some inter-squad scrimmages to keep it within that cohort and that group of 10 as we referred to. And then lastly, phase three, and this is really for after June 15th, this is no restrictions on training and activities. And this is um, following the guidance of, of Governor Abbott and the state of Texas, that after June 15th, this is an, an option for people. But again, we would caution people about traveling and scrimmages and games outside of the club or outside of that environment. For larger clubs, that might be easier. For smaller clubs, definitely something to consider. Um, is it worth taking that cohort and that group and mixing them with another cohort or group where maybe you don't know what kind of social distancing practices or things they've done prior to that and risking, you know, a, a, a contagious breakout within your group that might force you to step backwards. So definitely when you go into phase three, it should be still with caution and people should be thinking about what that looks like and what the risk and the reward is for that action instead of rushing out to play games. Just a few quick examples for you for phase one. Um, to the left-hand side there maybe shows some, some individual work that you can set up with players and it shows where it's spaced on the field as well. So that's using half of a field. Um, they have 13 players in that group on half of a field. Obviously you're limited to, to 10 right now, um, but, but that would allow, or sorry, 10 as of Monday. Um, but this shows different ways in which they can do different things. So some of it's ball work, some of it's physical exercises, some of it might involve them passing the ball back and forth between another player. Um, and then the other one on the right hand side is just like a basic pa passing pattern. There's a million different ways in which you could do this, but it's, the players are still distanced, but they're able to pass the ball between each other um, and, and still get some activity and some movement within that shape. Phase two, like we said, becomes looking, uh, starts to look a little bit more like the game. Uh, maybe it's like a 3v2 rondo, like you would see to the right hand side of your, your, uh, your screen. Maybe it's a small 2v2 or 3v3 game like you would see on the left-hand side, um, or a 3v3 plus three where you have neutrals in the middle or you've got a defending team that has to press, um, or perhaps it's a slightly larger game, 4v4 or even 5v5 to some smaller goals, or some targets or some end zones. Um, coaches have lots of ideas about this, but it's really mixing these type of um, games in to be able to maximize the space and utilize the number of players that you have at your disposal. A couple of other things just to consider. Um, again, to touch on this, and I, I don't think we can continue to go back to this too much, but clearly communicate with your members, local health officials, and when needed with South Texas Youth Soccer. You know, if there's questions, there's issues, there's, there's an outbreak, and how do we handle this? 
Um, communication is key there, uh, particularly with your members, but also with your local health officials and with ourselves. Um, how do we reintroduce goalkeepers to practices? We had this conversation the other day with people um, who said, hey, I, I, we had thought about everything, but we hadn't thought about goalkeepers. And so, you know, goalkeepers are touching the ball with their hands. They're spitting on their gloves. They're doing all sorts of stuff. What does that look like? They're catching balls that have been with multiple different players. So how do we introduce those goalkeepers? When do we do that? What's the timing for that? That's something to definitely consider. Um, when to play games, when to play tournaments. Again, I would caution people on that. Um, you know, rushing out to play games uh, from a physical standpoint for players and also from a safety standpoint might not be the, the thing that, to do and, and definitely consider what that looks like. Um, travel obviously is gonna be something we'll continue to consider, I think, long into the fall. Um, and then again, to go back to the cohorts and to explain this, because we keep touching on this, these cohorts and these groups of players that we're encouraging you to keep together with one coach. The reason we're saying that is that the CDC and other groups are saying, in that case, it's easy to, to trace any type of outbreak. So you can trace contact. Whereas if players are mingling between different cohorts or coaches are mingling between different cohorts, if there's an outbreak in one, now you're having to shut down multiple groups or multiple uh, cohorts, um, even if there isn't a spread. In, in a worst case scenario, now there's a spread between multiple co cohorts or multiple groups. And as Janae said, if you have a, a spread between three different cohorts, um, you're, you need to contact your local health officials to talk about what steps need to be taken. Um, so this is just a way to limit how you can spread that. Obviously with coaches, um, typically coach multiple teams that might not be as viable. And if that's the case, then it's important to stress to coaches the importance of their social distancing so that they're not actively involved um, with players to where they might take something and spread it to one of the other cohorts. Having field markings and signage clear entry points, a different exit point to where you don't have people mingling back and forth, um, sharing those in maps and, and, and visuals uh, through emails and social media and things like that definitely help with parents knowing where to go and what to do and players know where, where to go and what to do. Definitely limit the use of shared equipment once again, um, try and find ways to limit pennies being shared and things like that. Um, and as Janae said, some of these players are, are not gonna be able to return because maybe they have someone in their house who has a health issue and compromised uh, immune system maybe someone in their house is elderly and, and they're not feeling safe about returning to normal, there needs to be a plan in place for you to how you handle those particular uh, cases and what you provide for those people. So continuing that online um, virtual training environment, uh, which most of you have set in place is, is something that's key. Um, summer camps and clinics, uh, what we're saying right now is to follow CDC recommendations for summer camps and obviously the guidance of the governor and, and the state of Texas. And then always being prepared and, and communicating with people that there may be a need to return to social distancing protocols or to take steps backwards in the phases should there be an outbreak or a spread. For here, I'm going to pass this on, I believe, to uh, Jennifer Davis, and she's going to pick up with some additional resources for you. Oh, let's see, we got some poll results too, which I think you all can see. So that's interesting to see um, of when people plan on returning and how concerned they are. Looks like most people are slightly concerned, families and players are slightly concerned about returning. Um, good information. Um, okay, so I wanted to share um, a couple, so just today, in fact, I was given some information from US Soccer. They are developing a program called Play On, and it is their return to play recommendations. Again, guidelines, recommendations, best practices, they're not dictating, not mandating. Um, it will be posted on their website. Uh, I think come Monday, they said they're releasing it officially. Uh, and they're starting with phase one, which is individual and small group training as we discussed in our phase. Their program is uh, five phases, considering that phase zero was stay in shelter. Ours is three, it's similar, but it's another resource for you to use um, in terms of transitioning from one phase to the next. They also give suggested durations, which we um, didn't want to put too much in so that there was flexibility, because again, you're gonna have to follow your local guidelines. Um, but it follows a similar pattern to ours. One thing they do say is their recommended small group training is a max of nine 
players in one coach. Um, again, that's a recommendation. It does not have to be that. It could depend on the size of the team, but cohorts, um, similar to us, we say 10, they say nine. So it's pretty similar. I think they took nine because they were thinking a team of 18 split into two. Um, so it's just another resource. We'll give you some links. Again, it'll be posted on their website. Uh, it's a very comprehensive document. Some other resources, some of the things we've referenced tonight and things that you will want to look at if you have not already looked up. And again, you will get this presentation so you will see, have access to these uh, resources, state of Texas guidelines, the CDC considerations, uh, the USU soccer return to activity resources, uh, Aspen Int Institute's project play is an excellent resource for um, different facets of the coronavirus and youth sports and how what return to play is going to look like and how that's going to be. And then, as I said, the US soccer play on recommendations and their guide, which will be very comprehensive. Um, a little bit about what we're doing um, in terms of other programs that we have, just so you all are aware. Obviously, most of you know us and know what we provide. One thing we have added during this time is an esports program. We're working on that and that will be developed more as we go on. Um, but that's just kind of give you an idea of all the things that we offer, I think. So I wanted to go through the Q&A. We did get several questions and I'm gonna call on different panelists to kind of answer, help answer some of these. So forgive me as I try and read through what some of these questions were. We got several questions about masks and if players and coaches should be wearing masks, how and when and what we're looking at for that. So Janae, if you would like to take that one. Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, I have been really interested in this topic of masks and face coverings myself. And uh, I've had the opportunity to ask this question on several webinars with national governing bodies. The, this afternoon at four o'clock, Dr. George Champus, who is the medical advisor for US soccer, gave a presentation and he specifically spoke about face coverings. And the, the, the message is consistent with the CDC. Uh, and, and we mentioned it earlier, but I, I think it's warrants sharing again. Uh, they're very clear that they are advising all participants to wear face coverings or face masks as they are arriving to practice uh, it, while they're standing around and being explained or having uh, directions explained to them. However, when the players are participating, they uh, can take off the face masks um, and play. Uh, that also helps with any respiratory issues that they might have uh, so that they can play the game. They do recommend that coaches put on a face mask and keep a face mask on when they are in closer proximity to the group of players giving instructions or uh, verbal directions for whatever's happening. But the coaches could remove the face mask during those actual periods of training activity. But as soon as the training activity is ended, they are recommending that face coverings or face masks are put on. They do not recommend that any infants under the age of two wear face masks. They do not recommend that any adult or child that has any respiratory issues wear a face mask. And they also made a really excellent point that if a player uh, feels like they will be more comfortable wearing a face mask, as long as it's not impeding their vision on the field and their breathing, uh, they should be allowed the option to do so as they return uh, to play. So I hope that provides some clarity about the face mask topic uh, and when you might recommend to your coaches about when to wear them and when they might be able to take them off safely. Thank you. Uh, Gareth, here's some for you. Let's see. One question is, what would be the recommendation on how many people, including the coach, can be in the same training group, four, 10, or unlimited starting on Monday, June 1st? Yeah, I think as of right now, the state is mandating 10 or less until June 15th. So, um, you know, keeping it in that small group uh, is, is key. Obviously, if you have a larger group than that, maybe you stagger practices where one comes for 45 minutes, another comes for 45 minutes after. Um, but, but keeping the, the distance between those groups is probably key um, and, and no need maybe to rush into that full group until after June 15th. That leads into the second part of that is what would be the recommendation on the space that can be used for each training group? What yeah. would be the recommendation on the space between training groups? 
Yeah, I think that that's key, right? So obviously you need to keep a six feet distance between an edge of a training session or a training grid or another grid. So let's say you have 13 players doing individual ball work on a half of a field, having six feet uh, uh, or six feet radius uh, um, grids doesn't do you any good if they're square to each other. So you may need to make sure that there's a six feet minimum gap in between. I would recommend maybe going eight, 10, 12 feet in between. Um, so that even if a player is at the very edge of their square, or we all know a player is going to chase a ball a couple of feet outside the, the square and you know, trying to get it back, but maybe they're not running into somebody else in that situation. So um, just trying to limit it and mitigate it as much as possible, um, but, but definitely keeping spaces in between any of those grids. Okay, Noah, I've got one for you. Uh, some teams are looking at going to tournaments out of state. We can try to inform them, but what else? Are travel permits going to be issued? Um, yeah, so if anyone does submit any travel for the uh, summer tournaments coming up, uh, one, we would still be reviewing those uh, currently. Um, first, it would kind of follow what the South Texas um, plot return to play would be. So kind of pending based on the governor's uh, timing of the dates of when these tournaments are. Uh, one, they would have to be kind of cleared by that um, and or by the state. Um, for activity in South Texas, and then not only in the uh, state that they would be traveling to. Um, so now if this is kind of a North Texas situation, um, ideally we would still be doing our due diligence and contacting the uh, other state um, and potentially as well as the tournament, just making sure that uh, recommendations and minimum standards are being met uh, for this uh, tournament. So we'll be reviewing those as they come. Okay, thank you. Um, one, I can answer one. Should coaches encourage high risk players to hold off on attending practices and games? Yes. <laughs> I don't even, I don't have a lot of detail to it. Just yes, absolutely. If, if any parents, families, if any of the players themselves are high risk in any way, we recommend that you do not uh, require them to come to participate yet or to participate virtually until they, until it's safe for them to come back to play. Um, what else? Let's see. Gareth, here's another one for you. During games, has there been a consideration about having teams on opposite sides of the field? Away team and parents on one side, home team and parents on the opposite side. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, there's been conversations and I've heard people speak about this and uh, we haven't gotten to that phase because we're, we don't have lead uh, play yet or games yet, but I think it's definitely a consideration moving forward and, and how we can limit that. Now, how that looks in a park and how you set that up, because obviously, uh, for instance, if you're playing 7v7, you've got four teams on a field. There's going to be people sitting back to back on the middle of the field or 9v9. There'll be people sitting back to back. Uh, so it, easier for an 11v11 setup, but for some of the smaller sided 4v4, 7v7, 9v9 setups, um, that becomes a real planning uh, challenge. So uh, definitely something to consider as we move forward into games. I think our hope is that, that people are playing games in local within club environments, not in staged games where we have substitute benches and parents and all that kind of stuff set up uh, for now, I, I think is, is probably our, our guidance. Perfect. Um, there's one about tryouts starting June 1st. This would entail more than 15 players at a time. How will that work? I'm assuming that tryouts will still have to stay within the 10 player max groups, correct? Gareth, you wanna? They should, they should, my understanding is that until June 15th, they should be staying within that um, 10, 10 person limit. So they can host tryouts, but they can host tryouts within those parameters, within those restrictions. Yeah. Thanks. Can I add to that as well? Mm -hmm. I, I think uh, one of the key messages I hope that you take away is that have a plan and actively communicate the plan and follow safe and best practices. And if, you're, if your club is following those practices, I don't be afraid to, to advertise that you're doing the right thing for the players and their families. Um, and I think that will go a long way in this moment as uh, players and families are making decisions about returning uh, and participating in tryouts. So definitely. Good. Um, here's another one. I have seen indications that sub clubs and states are requiring parents to sign communicable disease waivers. Will STISA be doing this? Uh, we will not at this time. I'm not going to say we won't ever require that. Um, really the waivers uh, you can institute your own waiver at a club level for your parents to sign. Um, waivers don't necessarily help with the legal issue. What waivers do is really um, is having the parent acknowledge the risk of participating. 
So while, you know, it may, it may be good to have that piece of paper so that you can at least say the parents knew there was a risk, um, but technically there's not a lot of legal standing to them. Um, that's what lawyers tell me. So um, at this time we will not, but you can absolutely institute those on a club or an association level if you feel you need to do that. Um, next question, Noah, here's another one for you. Will our certificates of insurance be sufficient, sufficient for us to use should facilities require a special liability indemnification through this epidemic? Um, yes, it would. Um, the COI would kind of cover through any facility. Um, if it's already been issued, obviously we, what we have on our form is kind of that there were current inspections. Uh, what I would definitely recommend is as we kind of re-integrate uh, back into these times, it's kind of remember to reinforce these goalpost inspections. Um, a lot of these facilities have been not in use. Um, so just kind of being aware of uh, kind of walking the grounds uh, prior to any kind of maybe tryouts and kind of moving into the, the 15th. Um, but yes, if there are any additional, sometimes uh, a facility may require additional language um, you can definitely contact uh, Brenna in our office um, or definitely myself and we can kind of help walk you through what would be needed if uh, additional language would be uh, needed to be added to the certificate of insurance. Uh, this is something that we can't directly do, but we would work with K&K &K, um, who covers the insurance and they will also kind of outline uh, any adjustments or what basically are minimum and maximums which would be outlined on that certificate um, that we issue. Perfect, thank you. Um, just the last couple of questions. I know we're getting close to time and I wanna keep on schedule, not keep everybody over. Um, there's been a couple of questions about fees and if we're going to lower fees for the fall or how what that may look like. Um, we, that's a good question. Uh, we intend in terms of com our competitions and team fees that we will be operating as of now, a full schedule in the fall. Um, we are looking at our, the, the, the competitions that we schedule, we're looking at um, adjusting those so they're a little more local competition, there's less travel, things like that, but we are planning as of now to do that. I will say the, as far as player fees, the uh, executive committee has been discussing lower a lower fee for the fall given everybody's financial situation so i would anticipate information on that coming out shortly and um i i do see that happening and i don't want anybody on the call who's on the ec to get mad at me for saying that um other let me just look and see if there's any other last questions um tournament play are you recommending or mandating tournament hosts to abide to social distancing such as parents not attending uh we are not because we're not mandating any of these we would uh obviously would like for them to follow the recommendations but they are not mandates so we will not be mandating that um ooh, now the questions are coming in um, will the play, this is a good one, uh, will the player insurance cover COVID treatments if a player comes down with COVID as a result of soccer play? Noah, you want that one? Um, that's probably pretty complicated. I think most of that we would be going through uh, more direct for, with K&K &K, um, on any specifics that would kind of outline the health policy, but we do have the full uh, player policy that on our website under the insurance page that would kind of outline everything uh, currently. Um, and I'd have to brush up to see if there are any uh, specific uh, pandemic um, mentions, but as, as far as that, I would have, probably have to air to the insurance company. Yeah, I mean, what I will say is that um, the, what insurance, what, what I've had conversations with our insurance company is that COVID itself is not covered because it is not a accident. It's not, it's not something that's covered under the liability policy. It's not an accident or something that occurred in practice like that. Um, it's kind of like the, the example I was given is, it's not exactly the best example, but if a player got the flu and then had to go get treatment for the flu, that is not something we would cover. And it's the similar type of, um, situation because there's no, we can't dictate exactly where they got it from necessarily. And it's more of a health issue rather than an accident or a liability issue, which is covered under insurance. 
So hopefully that helps. Um, are you going to have summer fees is the probably looks like time wise the last question we'll be able to get in. Um, uh, I do anticipate we'll have summer fees. I do not know if there will be a reduction, but I do. Uh, we will if you are playing in the summer and your players need to be covered by insurance. We will have summer fees. All right. Um, Janae, Gareth, or Noah, do you want to wrap up or say anything to finish up? Um, I, I just want to say say thank you to everyone for taking the time to come on here and for being leaders in the community to to you know take the time to educate themselves and, and hopefully we we able able to add some value to something and you took something away from today that, that you can take back and help keep everyone safe in your own communities. Yeah, I just wanted to add, uh, we want to be a resource for, for all of you. Uh, if you're looking for more ideas about training sessions, if you're looking for more detail about travel or insurance, like please reach out to us. I've just put our office number, which uh, we, are all, we are all working at the moment remotely, but we're all available all week to be able to respond to you and to reach out to you. So again, thank you so much for being a part of this call and please let us know how we can help you going forward. Yeah, absolutely. Just thank you guys for participating. Um, hopefully, we're hoping to provide a little direction because I know there's a lot of confusion and a lot of questions out there. Again, we've provided a lot of resources. Um, please look at them. Please reach out to us if you have questions. Um, we are here for you. And just remember, be safe and uh, be smart. And some people ask if we're going to get a copy of the presentation. You will get information sent to you. I know Gareth is also working on sort of a condensed version that might be good for you to share with other people. So we will be getting information out to you. So thank you guys very much. Have a great night. Stay safe and uh, let us know if we can help you in any way. Thanks. Thank you.